A glimpse of the wealth looted by Mahmud of Ghazni will give us a glimpse, will give us an idea about how rich India was in terms of wealth as well as terms of, uh, in terms of temple heritage. It took only 20 days to, for uh, Sultan Mahmud to ruin the uh, city completely. Like he not only plundered the city, he also killed the weak and the innocent, took many as captives, uh, raped women and took them as sex slaves, raised temples to the ground, broke the idols, looted all the wealth that he could come across in temples as well as, and then he set the city on fire. Had the barbaric plunderer not plundered India, not to mention other Islamic plunderers followed by the British, India would have continued to be a self-sufficient country with no signs of poverty and with uh, no problems plaguing India, with no various problems plaguing India at present. Namaste. Delighted to be amongst a wonderful audience here. India has uh, always fascinated the world in one or the other ways. In ancient and early medieval period, we were famous for being known as a country where riches overflowed. And true it was. We were truly and correctly known as Sone Ki Chiria. Gold has always been the favorite of Indians as it is considered very, very precious and often offered to the deities. So we have been, since time immemorial, been very generous for donating for religious purposes. So obviously temples have always been the richest places in India. It was this whiff of unimaginable wealth that brought hounds and bloodhounds like Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni to our doorsteps. As the topic is uh, related to history, I'd like to give a very brief gist about uh, our glory as well as how our historical dates have been uh, distorted by the West. India was the richest country in the world in, term, in terms of everything, right from wealth to knowledge heritage. So who doesn't know about our ancient Takshashila and Nalanda universities, where students from across the world came and studied? Our civilization is the oldest surviving civilization in the world, dating back to thousands of years. The Vedas are the first poems ever composed on this earth. So when did the Vedic era start? While Puranic and numerous other records mark the start of the Vedic era at 15,000 BCE, Britishers dropped one zero and marked 1500 BCE as the start of the Vedic era. So if you search online, even you will find Wikipedia showing 1500 to 500 BCE as the Vedic period. So the Ramayana and the Mahabharata happened after the Vedic period. So obviously these two events did not take place after 500 BCE. The West follow 4004 BCE as the start of creation and they consider Herodotus as the father of history to show that civilization started in Greece only. The Westerns consider all Indian dates as fake. Now why do we need to depend on what and how the West fixes our historical dates for us? But it is a hard truth and I must say, we maximum Indians ape the West and believe whatever they say as true. So during the 200 years of British rule and the way our education system has been designed after independence, our minds have been molded to be like this. So there is still time we can go back to our roots and take pride in our past glory. So this is how our uh, history uh, and glory has been distorted by the West. Uh, it is a long discussion and by continuing to discuss on this, we'll be only deviating away from the topic of today. That is a glimpse of India's wealth looted by Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni. So how rich was Aryavart, or to speak in today's terms, India a thousand years ago? A glimpse of the wealth looted by Mahmud of Ghazni will give us a glimpse, will give us an idea about how rich India was in terms of wealth as well as terms of, uh, in terms of temple heritage. 
So, uh, though Mahmud, uh, Mahmud's raid was centered around uh, uh, central, northern, and western India. So, most of you here must have visited uh, ancient and medieval era temples in India. I hope so. No. So, like in Hoysala, then uh, Khajuraho, Ajanta, Elora, and there are many, many other temples are there spread across the country. So, most uh, of these uh, temples, you, you can well imagine the time and money spent in uh, building these wonderful temples, not to mention the masonry uh, of the uh, gifted artisans in sculpting those wonderful carvings. Do you know Mahmud of Ghazni destroyed hundreds and thousands of these wonderful temples? Like few of these uh, temples that he destroyed near Mathura uh, were 4,000 years old, which in today's date, date would have been 5,000 years old. This could have been standing proofs of our, of our ancient civilization. And uh, 16th to 17th century, a Persian historian, Ferista, has given a detailed account about the loot and plunder committed by Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni in India. The, most of the facts that I shall be presenting today are based on uh, Ferista's book, A History of the Rise of Mohammedan Power in India, translated by John Briggs. So how much wealth did Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni loot from India from uh, his 17 expeditions in between 1001 to 1025 CE? Probably more than what the British looted in two centuries. So uh, according to a few researchers and uh, historians, the British loot has been estimated at uh, $45 trillion, while few researchers estimate uh, the amount at uh, 48 trillion dollars. So when we speak about uh, wealth in the context of today's topic, uh, it would include the annual tributes collected by Mahmud from the several Indian rulers uh, for several years, then the value of war elephants that uh, Sultan Mahmud took to Ghazni from India every time he came to loot, the uh, wealth they looted from forts and temples, uh, loot of uh, Gold, golden idols and silver idols that uh, number to some hundreds and thousands of them. Then um, gold and silver plates and ingots, gold ornaments, then uh, gemstones and uh, jewels like sapphires, uh, emeralds, corals, then uh, diamonds, etc. According to Persian historian Firista, with the wealth that uh, Mahmud looted and took to Ghazni, he turned Ghazna, which uh, included uh, Pakistan, parts of uh, Afghanistan and Eastern Ira Iran, into a wealthy empire. Each household, according to Firista, was abundantly rich, abundantly rich, with several slaves. So those, uh, the slaves were captives taken from India and uh, they were especially women who were turned into sex slaves. So I would like to delve on one point here. There are a few questions which often crop up in your minds, like in your minds too. Like were we always defeated? Didn't our ancestors offer any resistance? Did our ancestors surrender so easily? Well. Um, uh, when I posted uh, this uh, about this event on uh, Facebook, uh, someone commented thus, we talk of invaders, looters, and destroyers. What did the local people do then? No resistance, no valor, no show of unity and strength, no effort in uniting people. What historians did about it? People are in dark due to one-sided narrative. So we weren't always defeated. Our ancestors did offer stiff resistance. They fought till their last breath. Now uh, let me give one example. Sultan Mahmud could not loot and plunder Kashmir. Why? Because the Raja of Kashmir offered stiff resistance. He was Raja Sangrama Raja, who was the uh, founder of the Lohara dynasty. And he repulsed two attacks of Ghazni. Besides that, he also offered military aid to uh, Trilochan Pala, the Raja of Lahore. Uh, like with military support to fight against Mahmud. The combined army defeated Mahmud. 
Though uh, in another battle, Trilochan Pala was defeated, but the combined army did defeat Mahmud. So I'll be giving more uh, examples of resistance later. So many are driven by the wrong notion that uh, Indian rulers did not unite against a common enemy, like the Islamic plunderers. But here they are wrong again. Like, uh, let me give a few examples. In the year 978, 978 CE, Mahmud, along with his father, Subhaktuzin, attacked Jaipal. The Raja, of Jaipal. the Raja of Lahore, Jaipal sought military aid from the neighboring North Indian rulers. The rulers of uh, Delhi, Kanoj, Kalinjar, and Ajmer provided military support. They also gave financial help. The combined army uh, fought against uh, Sultan Mahmud's uh, uh, huge army in uh, Lunghan and the outskirts of Lahore. So let me quote Firista here. Subhaktuzin ascended a hill to view the forces of Jaipal, which appeared in extent like the boundless ocean and in number like the ants or the locusts of the wilderness. So you can well imagine the strength of the army of Jaipal, the Hindu army of Jaipal against the Mahmud's forces. But the Hindu army of Jaipal lacked strategy. And Subhaktuzin was very clever. So again, let me quote Firista. Subhaktuzin's soldiers, though few in number, were divided into squadrons of 500 men each, which were directed to attack success successively in one particular point of the Hindu line so that it might continually have to encounter fresh troops. The Hindus being worse mounted than the cavalry of Subhaktujin were unable to withstand them and wearied out by the maneuver just mentioned began to give way. Subhaktujin perceiving their disorder made a general assault. So the Hindu army was thus defeated and uh, Raja Jaipal was allowed to continue his rulership against uh, the promise of the payment of a handsome annual tribute. So let me give another example. In 1008 CE, Anandpal, who succeeded his uh, father Jaipal to the throne of Lahore, provided military aid to one of Mahmud's enemies. This enraged Mahmud. So he marched towards Lahore with a huge army. Anandpal immediately sought uh, military aid from uh, the neighboring rulers, especially rulers from North India. And the North Indian rulers were very fast to respond. The rulers of Gwalior, Ujjain, Delhi, Ajmer, Kanoj sent troops towards Lahore. And do you know Hindu women from far and near sold their gold ornaments to support, for, to donate for this cause. And besides uh, the alliance of North Indian rulers, uh, few tribes also provided support to this alliance. And uh, what mentioning is the Gukut tribe of Punjab. So as the battle started, in the, let me quote Firista again, 30,000 Gukkurs with their heads and feet bare. So they did not wear, uh, they did not cover the uh, yeah, headbands or they did not wear any slippers. With their heads and feet bare and armed with various weapons, penetrated into the Mohammedan lines where a dreadful carnage ensued. And 5,000 Mohammedans in a few minutes were slain. So, now, the, because if I describe the complete battle, it will, like, it will go on and on. So I, I have just quoted two lines from Firista. So the, the Hindus were almost winning this battle when um, Anandpal, who commanded the Hindu army, faced an uncontrollable situation. So luck did not favor us since the last 1,000 years. So the elephant he was riding on, suddenly turned unruly due to the effect of naphthala balls and the flight of arrows towards it. Then it fled away from the battlefield. This confused the Hindu army who were already winning. And they too started fleeing from the battlefield, seeing their king run away. Likewise, other rulers also offered resistance to Mahmud, but their army and military strategy proved weaker than that of Mahmud. So there, are two, there were two key reasons why Indian rulers failed in battle against Mahmud and later Islamic plunderers and invaders. Number one, 
the fighting spirit in Indian warriors started declining after, after the concept of non-violence gained momentum. So, most Indian kings and their subjects lost interest in warfare. Most rulers did get little importance to maintaining a strong army or upgrading their military infrastructure. So generation after generation, the courage, fearlessness, and valor, which were otherwise the key attributes of uh, warriors and soldiers, started to decline. And, and hence, they were taken unawares when uh, Mahmud of Ghazni attacked or other Islamic plunderers attacked. But not all kingdoms followed this concept of nonviolence. Those rulers who kept a ready, steady army and upgraded their military infra infrastructure survived the attacks. And there are uh, many examples. There are many examples of our tales of valor of our ancestors, uh, uh, the resistance they, uh, they offered and the victories they won. But these uh, are not highlighted in history. We have been projected as losers. The in our invaders have been glorified. So how do we take pride of our ancestors? So as, um, uh, as two slides back, I've showed you a comment posted by someone on Facebook. Like why didn't our ancestors of our resistance, why were we always defeated so and so? This is because uh, we have grown up reading only the tales of valor of invaders, not about our ancestors. So the, the confusion prevails. Number two, Indian rulers always followed the rules of dharma in warfare. They never fought against an opponent who, is al who was already engaged or involved in the fight with another. They took care of the injured at the end of the day. They never stabbed from behind or they avoided hitting below the navel. And they considered women, prisoners of war, and farmers as sacred. They never pillaged land or destroyed standing structures. They were merciful if um, enemies sought pardon. And battlefield exploits always took place during the day. This was followed since time immemorial. But Islamic plunderers and invaders did exactly opposite these rules of dharma followed by the Indian warriors. They followed the tactics of treachery, deception, and cruelty. So they plundered kingdoms. They uh, raped women and took them as sex slaves. They killed the weak and the innocent. They stabbed from behind. They destroyed standing st structures. They raised temples to the ground. And they broke idols. They looted wealth. What and what not. So converting the defeated to Islam was one of their key strategies. So there are hundreds of examples of uh, both. But again, uh, by talking, uh, discussing on that, it will be like deviating away from the main topic. Firista, through the eyes of uh, Sultan Mahmud, has, have, uh, descri has described many Indian cities as grand. So Mahmud destroyed uh, many of these grand cities and spared few against a promise of a um, payment of a handsome annual tribute. So few of the grand cities worth mentioning are Mathura, Somnath, Thaneswar, Nagarkot, then uh, Lahore, and the list goes on. So our focus area today in this session would be the cities of Lahore, Thaneshwar, Mathura, Nagarkot, and Somnath. So let us start with Mathura. About Mathura, Sultan Mahmud wrote a letter to his governor that no one could build a city as grand as Mathura within a period of even 200 years involving lakhs of dinars that it was next to impossible in building such a grand city. So you can well imagine how grand Mathura was a thousand years ago. Can you imagine the intensity of destruction of Mathura caused by the barbaric plunderer? The grand city turned into ruins in 20 days. Mathura was then under the ruler of Delhi. But as I uh, described uh, earlier, that uh, most Indian rulers did not keep a ready standing army. And hence, uh, the ruler of Delhi could not protect the holy city. It took only 20 days to, for uh, Sultan Mahmud to ruin the uh, city completely. Like he 
not only plundered the city, he also killed the weak and the innocent, took many as captives, uh, raped women and took them as sex slaves, raised temples to the ground, broke the idols, looted all the wealth that he could come across in temples as well as, and then he set the city on fire. He set the grand city on fire. So as I uh, told earlier, near Mathura, uh, there are a few temples which were around 4,000 years old. So these temples would have been uh, 5,000 years old, or as I said earlier, this could have been standing proof of our, of our ancient civilization. So let me quote Firista here. Among the temples of Mathura, so uh, Mathura was pronounced as Mutra. So, among the temples of Mathura were found five golden idols whose eyes were of rubies, valued at 50,000 dinars. On another idol was found a sapphire wing 400 miscals. And the image itself being melted down produced 90,300 miscals of pure gold. Besides these images, there were above 100 idols of silver which loaded as many camels. The king tarried in Mathura in 20 days, in which time the city suffered greatly from fire besides the damage it sustained by being pillaged. At length, he continued his march along the course of a stream on whose banks were seven strong fortifications, all of which fell in succession. There are also discovered some very ancient temples, which according to the Hindus had existed for 4,000 years. Having set these temples and forts, the troops were led against the fort of Munj. Munj is, um, is a Rajput kingdom. So after looting and destroying Mathura, he proceeded towards the Rajput kingdoms. So near Mathura, he destroyed seven forts. So you can well imagine the intensity of destruction caused by Mahmud in Mathura. So let us uh, take Nagarkot. So in 1009 CE, Sultan Mahmud attacked Nagarkot, which was located at the Kangra Valley in Himachal Pradesh. So he plundered the city, raising temples to the ground and breaking the idols. The Mohammedan army destroyed Bhim Fort, setting it on fire after killing the inhabitants and looting wealth. The fort, located atop a steep mountain, served as the treasury for various small neighboring kingdoms. So the gold and other valuables donated by devotees in the temples of Nagarkot and in the neighboring kingdoms were stored in this fort. So you can well imagine the amount of wealth stored in the fort. So in Bhim, Bhim was the fort. It uh, was built by Raja Bhim. He was from the clan of Yudhisthira uh, of Kurukshetra. So uh, the fort was built uh, several centuries ago. And since the time of Bhim, uh, wealth had been stored in the fort treasury. So he looted all the wealth stored in that fort. So in Vim were found seven lakh golden dinars, 700 months of gold and silver plate, 200 months of pure gold in ingots, 2000 months of silver bullion, and 20 months of various jewels, including pearls, corals, diamonds, and rubies, which had been collected since the time of Bhim. Details of which would be tedious. So he has not given full complete details of the amount of wealth looted from that fort. So you can well imagine how much wealth was looted from Nagarkot only. So I've already described how much wealth he looted from Mathura. So, and then at Nagarkot. Like there are various uh, numerical, like one one varies from 2 LB to 11 LB according to, no, one one varies from 2 LB to 11 LB according to historians of those times. But again, according to today's calculations, these are much higher than the given amount. So let me quote here 20 months, 20 months of various jewels. So jewels uh, are the gemstones like sapphires, rubies, diamonds, pearls, emeralds. So uh, let me give one instance here, which is away from the topic again. Like I have uh, practiced as an astrologer for quite a number of years and I have also prescribed gemstones. I used to prescribe gemstones to uh, as remedies. So, I have also start, uh, studied gemology. So I know the value of the stones. So 20 months of various jewels, then you can well imagine how many kilos, more than 100 kgs. 
going by the historians, going by the account of the historians of those, uh, that period, it is around 95 to 100 kgs. But going by today's account, it goes beyond 100 kgs. So 100 kgs of jewels. So I am wearing a jerkin. Uh, this are uh, weighed in carats. One carat. Uh, this is uh, just a tiny one, and the, I'm wearing a yellow sapphire also. And so the per carat, the yellow sapphire, the value of yellow sapphire ranges from say forty thousand to three lakhs. And, for, and in, according to today's value, because I've dealt in gemstones while uh, prescribing for uh, when. Uh, Clients used to come for uh, to show their charts, horoscopes. So, 100 kgs of jewels, you can well imagine the value. So I'm just letting you guess. Such was the vastness of the booty looted from uh, Nagar court that upon return to Ghazni, Sultan Mahmud arranged a magnificent festival where uh, to uh, commemorate his success in looting wealth from India. So in this festival, he displayed uh, the looted wealth in golden thrones. So the jewels and gemstones were piled up in a plain area for display. So and, uh, to every officer of the Ghaznavid empire, Sultan Mahmud uh, conferred a princely gift from the looted wealth. So let me quote Firista here. Mahmud, having reached Thaneswar before the Hindus had time to take measures for its defense, the city was plundered, the idols broken, and the idol Jaksoma was sent to Gijni to be trodden underfoot. According to Haji Muhammad Kandahari, a ruby was found in one of the temples weighing 450 miscals. One miscal is equal to 4.25 gram. So, Ruby, four or five zero miscals means uh, such a big ruby and uh, it would have cost, uh, cost around uh, trillions. I'm also wearing a ruby, such a small ruby, it cost around 20 to 25,000. So one big ruby, four fifty miscals. And it was allowed by everyone who saw it to be a wonder that had never been before even heard of. So uh, the idol Jaksoma, so anyone have, uh, have any idea about who the deity Jagsoma, we haven't heard. So Jagsoma may refer to Mahadev or Vishnu. So uh, Yam, Kuber, and Moon are also known by this name. So Firista has described the Jagsoma as the principal deity. So I have, uh, I'm an avid heritage traveler. So I have visited so many temples, ancient and medieval era temples in and around uh, central, western, and northern India. So uh, many of these temples dating back uh, from the 8th to 12th century, the principal deity of these temples uh, uh, like is either Mahadev or Vishnu. So going by that, uh, uh, Jaksama may be either Mahadev or Vishnu. So from his Thaneswar expedition, Sultan Mahmud took 2 lakh Hindus to Ghazni as captives. And every soldier in Ghazni became wealthy with riches and each household keeping several slaves. So this is Firista's account. This is not an account by any Indian historian. So Firista won't exaggerate facts. So only from his Thaneswar expedition, he took 2, 000, 2 lakh ca Indian captives. And most of these captives were women because they usually kill the men and take the women as slaves. So each household during that time used to have several women slaves. So you can well imagine only from Thaneswar if we could to take this many number of captives, then he looted, uh, he plundered India 17 times. So you can well imagine the count of the captives that he might have taken. Mahmud had heard a lot about the vast wealth stored in Somnath temple. He marched towards Somnath with a huge army. The rulers of Gujarat offered a stiff resistance. And the battle took place for several days until uh, Mahmud gained hold of the shrine. So in history, you, you, most of us, even I, while growing up, have read that the rulers of Gujarat did not offer any resistance. The king ran away. So we, we were 
projected as uh, losers, like we did not offer any resistance. But here, this is Firista's account, the resistance offered by the rulers of Gujarat, the princes of Gujarat. So the battle raged with great fury. Victory was long doubtful, till two Indian princes, Brahmadeo and Davislim, with other reinforcements, joined their countrymen during the action and inspired them with fresh courage. Mahmud, at this moment, pursuing his troops to waver, leaped from his horse and, prostrating himself before God, implored his assistance. Then mounting again, he took Abul Hassan the Circassian, one of his generals, by the hand, by way of encouragement, and advanced on the enemy. At the same time, he cheered his troops with such energy that ashamed to abandon their king, king here refers to Mahmud, with whom they had so often fought and bled that they, with one accord, gave a loud shout and rushed forwards. In this charge, the Muslims broke through the enemy's line and laid 5,000 Hindus dead at their feet. So this is just an example of the resistance offered by the Hindus. But as I already mentioned, they lacked strategy. So here is the description of Somna temple by Firista. Support edifice built of hewn stone. Hewn stone is uh, a stone slab cut from rocks and chiseled to perfection. The lofty roof was supported by 56 pillars. The wonderful carvings in the ceilings, walls, and pillars. So all carvings were set with precious stones. So this must be the only temple of its kind because all the carvings in the pillars, walls, and ceilings were set with precious stones, not to mention the idols. So there were some more than a thousand idols of deities in Somnath temple. So in the center of the hall was Somnath, a stone idol, five yards in height. So you can well imagine how the height of uh, the idol of Somnath. So one yard is equal to three feet. So five yards in height, two of which were sunk in the ground. Maybe one has to cl climb steps below to worship the idol. So there were no lighting arrangements except one pendant lamp. Jewels studded in the idols and walls reflected on the pendant lamp, which brightened the dark interiors. So let me come back to the last point. So ancient and medieval era temples, including temples of the modern period, have arrangements for lighting at night. So everyone knows that. But Somnath temple did not have any lighting arrangements. The whole, the whole interiors of uh, the Somnath temple were so full of jewels, studded in the walls, ceilings, idols, and uh, the pillars, that reflection of these jewels that fell on the pendant brightened up the dark interiors. So how gifted our ancient Indians were. So a huge chain of gold weighing around 200 months, you can, can well imagine how huge the chain must be. It hung from the top of the main building by a ring, and it supported a big bell, as is present in uh, all Hindu temples at the main entrance or at the entrance towards the Garvagriha, the Sanctum Sanctorum. Do you know a group of Brahmins uh, offered a huge donation of gold to Sultan Mahmud to save the idol of Somnath? Sultan's men agreed. And they even tried to convince their master. But Sultan Mahmud dis disagreed. Why? Because he wanted to be known in history as Mahmud the destroyer, yes. not as Mahmud the idol seller. So he directed his troops to continue with their destruction work. So Mahmud ordered his men to break the idol of Somnath. The hollow belly of the idol of Somnath was filled with precious gemstones and jewels. So when they broke open, they broke the idol, they discovered the hidden jewels in the belly. And uh, the value of these jewels were much, much higher than the value of the amount of gold offered by the Brahmins to save the idol. The king approaching the image raised his mace and struck off its nose. He ordered two pieces of the idol to be broken off and sent to Gajani that one might be thrown at the threshold of the public mosque and the other at the court door of his own palace. Two more fragments were reserved to be sent to Mecca and Medina. 
So when Firista wrote this book, it was past 600 years of the destruction of uh, Somnath by Mahmud. So Firista wrote that uh, identical fragments of uh, the Somnath idol were seen at Ghazni during his times. So the Somnath temple facts a thousand years ago. This is a, according to Firista. So three lakh visitors to the temple during eclipses. So during those times, a thousand years ago. So regular donations were offered by rulers as well as devotees from far and near. 2,000 villages were bestowed to the Somnath temple authorities for the maintenance of the temple. So ancient scriptures and surveys by British corroborate the grant of villages by rulers for maintaining of temples. Besides, uh, temples also served as uh, learning centers, like uh, there were good mats and gurukuls that served as uh, learning centers and also as treasury. The Shivalinga was bathed twice with Gangajal every day. So you can well imagine that the temple authorities must have traveled regularly to Haridwar to take Gangajal to Somnath. So 2,000 Brahmins served as priests in the temple. 300 barbers were appointed so the devotees save before entering the sanctum sanctorum. So Parista described that no royal treasury ever contained such vast wealth. Besides the main Somnath idol, there were thousands of other idols of deities in, in gold and silver. So as per Firista, the Somnath temple was a storehouse of vast wealth. No other royal treasury ever contained such great wealth. So Mahmud noted all the wealth of the temple. So amongst the earliest Hindu rulers to be subjugated by Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni was Jaipal, Raja Jaipal of Lahore. Mahmud and his father Subhuktujin had uh, attacked Jaipal in 978 CE. <coughs> uh, Jaipal was defeated and uh, the Ghaznavid ruler annexed major parts of the Lahore territory to the Ghaznavid empire. So Jaipal was let free against uh, payment of a handsome annual tribute. So when uh, Jaipal stopped paying the tribute, Mahmud attacked him again. It was 1001 CE, 978, then 1001. So in between, he regularly paid tributes. So you can, and the tribute uh, that he paid amounted to lakhs of dinars. So you can well imagine how much uh, uh, tribute Mahmud collected from Lahore alone. Now, Jaipal offered a steep resistance, but he could not, he uh, could not match the cruel tactics employed by Mahmud. So Jaipal was let free against uh, payment, again, let free against the payment of a handsome annual tribute, which uh, amounted to lakhs of dinars. So besides the tribute, Mahmud took from Jaipal 16 necklaces inlaid with jewels. One of the necklaces belonged to Jaipal, which during that time was valued at 1,80,000 dinars. This is an account by Firista. So Mahmud also took war elephants from each kingdom he came to loot. So you, uh, the value of war elephants going by today's time, you can well imagine. So Mahmud looted the wealth of uh, many other cities and collected tributes of uh, uh, numerous rulers for several years. So discuss, again, discussing each of them would be time consuming and the talk would go on and on. So this is a, an account by a Persian historian where truth prevails. So Firista would not exaggerate the facts, though he missed giving more details about the plunders, the loot committed by Mahmud of Ghazni. So Firista's account does give us an idea how rich India was a thousand years ago. So, so how rich and magnificent India was. Had the barbaric plunderer not plundered India, not to mention other Islamic plunderers followed by the British, India would have continued to be a self-sufficient country with no signs of poverty and with uh, no problems plaguing India, with no various problems plaguing India at present. So united we sustain and win, divided we fall and fail. Jai Hind. Thank you.